Hey family, it's Carlos Watson, and do I have a special episode for you today? Mariana Van Zellick. Now, you know her as the star of National Geographic. She's got a wonderful show there, Traffic. Goes all around the world, some of the most difficult situations, the so-called black market, stories you can't believe, and what an interesting woman. Enjoy. Whenever there's a battle in my mind between fear and curiosity, curiosity always wins. Are you ever scared? Behind those masks are a lot of times a lawyer, a suburban mom. I mean, not the people at all that you'd expect. I wanted to focus on the pimps themselves. You know how to put up your dukes? Are you someone who's quick with a gun? Or are you just faster? The Carlos Watson Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance. Mariana Von Zeller, welcome to the show. Thank you. Love being here. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. Where are you right now? I'm in my office in LA. Have you been traveling at all or what have you, what have you been doing over the whole? I have. Wow. And how have you done it? We have a pod. We travel together. It's my team, but we test everyone constantly. I think I've had 30 something tests, something ridiculous like that. And so far, none of us have caught it. And we've been all around nonstop traveling, including internationally and everything. You know, it's interesting because we realized that because of COVID, black markets have really exploded. So it's sort of more relevant than ever to do this show. Okay, okay, we're here, we're here. Right now, it's go time. It's military grade. It's not. Being superhuman is the game. It's a massive, massive fraud. This town was built on coke money. Sounds like money to me, no? No one knows what's going on behind closed doors. Which black markets do you think have benefited the most, if I can say it that way, from this time? All of them. Um, whenever there's an economic downturn, you know, whenever people lose their jobs and they have to figure out a way to bring food back to their families, they're often sort of forced to turn into black markets. And so we've seen an explosion in uh, sex trafficking, in the drug business, uh, even steroids. <laughs> I mean, you name it, uh, There's there's been a real increase this past year. Mariana Van Zeller is a woman who knows no limits. Thank you so much. The Peabody Award-winning Portuguese investigative journalist and host of National Geographic show Traffic is said to have one of the scariest jobs in the world. How did the show come about? I'm always interested in what I call kind of uh, startup stories. Like how does something go from an idea to a reality? How did this happen? It was decades in the making. So I've been covering black markets for over 15 years, almost my entire career as a journalist. Um, always been sort of attracted to these sort of underworlds because I, I do think they have a huge impact on our lives. They're all around us and they're sort of the most secretive corners in our world. Do you have a phone? I do. I'd like to have it. Okay. I don't want to be tricked. And I've worked at several TV stations and I've pitched this to many people and uh, never got done, essentially. And then I started working with National Geographic and they started liking my work and they came to me and said, we want to do a show with you. And I said, okay, great. I have, I have an idea for you. <laughs> what has surprised you the most? Because I think about people like you and Lisa Ling and others who get a chance to like see more of the world than most of us. Does anything surprise you anymore? Has anything surprised you meaningfully in the last year or two? I still get sort of, you know, that feeling you get super excited and you can't believe you're seeing this and you can't wait to come back and sort of share what you're seeing and all the information and knowledge you're gaining. So you're saying just this little amount here, if you were to ingest this somehow, this amount could kill you immediately. That's how powerful this stuff is. Are you ever scared? Not so much with people. I'm afraid of big animals, for example. <laughs> so we did a, one of the episodes we did is about tiger trafficking. And we spent a night in an area where there's some of the last remaining tigers in Thailand. So I knew we were out in a hammock, out in the open, and uh, surrounded by these wild creatures, including tigers. So in that situation, I was scared all night and I couldn't sleep. I would say that in the majority of times, uh, whenever there's sort of a, a battle in my mind between fear and curiosity. Curiosity always wins. And so far it's worked in my favor. When I think about all the dangerous situations you've been in and the fact that you still are able to choose curiosity over fear, why do you think you push ahead towards curiosity? When I was about 12 years old, I, I used to watch the Nightly News uh, show with my family every single night. And uh, I used to watch these anchors on Portuguese television just talk about the world and they knew everything about what was happening around the world. I had no idea they were reading from a teleprompter, <laughs> but that was sort of the moment that I realized, oh my God, this is it. I want to know as much as they do. And if that means becoming a journalist, that's what I want to do. What's the most dangerous 
situation or world you've been exposed to? I'm many. I mean, I've spent more time reporting in Sinaloa than anywhere else in the world. So I've been in situations where I've been surrounded by Sicarios. There's a guy in a orange jumpsuit with a mask. So it looks like that's uh, where they're doing the deal right here out in the open. Uh, in situations where, for example, the Mexican Marines were coming and they were getting ready for a firefight and they told us, if this happens, you're going to be stuck in the middle and we cannot protect you and you could be possibly killed. And then we saw the Marine helicopter coming our way and they start fleeing and we weren't sure what should we do, if we should start getting in a car and follow them or if we should stay and try to hide. Um, there's another situation also in Sinaloa where we went to look for El Chapo when he fled the Altiplano high security prison in Mexico. And we actually managed to get all the way up to La Tuna, which is a small town where he's from. And once we got there, uh, we immediately were told that we had 10 minutes to get out of, out of town or they'd come after us. I mean, there have been so many throughout the years, but there's an enormous amount of preparation and training that goes into place to minimize the risk because obviously no story is worth a life. Talk to me about you. Can you do you know how to put up your dukes? Are you someone who's <laughs> who's handy with the knife? Are you quick with a gun? Or are you just faster <laughs> than everybody else? Like if stuff goes down, like what happens? I the only martial arts I've ever did was a capoeira, which is the Brazilian dance thing that there's actually no contact, so it's very lame. Uh, I'm very persistent. So I think that's where my, my fight lies in, in that and persistence and in the field that really helps. But at the same time, also being very sure that you never cross the line. There was a, a journalism teacher once told me a line that I really love, which is, as a journalist, you have to make sure that you never cross the line, but you better come back with chalk on your feet. So it's this idea that you go as close to the action as possible without you know crossing that line. Talk to me about the pimps. What did you learn? What did you take away? Or, or had you already done a lot of reporting on that world before and you came to it with a certain level of knowledge? I had done a lot of reporting on sex trafficking, but I hadn't interviewed or spent as much time as I did this time around. So part of what I wanted to do for this episode in, this, in Trafficked was to really sort of focus on the pimps themselves and try to sort of understand how they do, why they do it, and, and all that. And I think we reached out to over a hundred pimps. It turns out they're actually not that difficult to find. They promote a lot of their work and their services online, uh, on Instagram, for example. But at the end, after reaching out to over a hundred, I think we got uh, just a handful that, that came back to us and agreed to eventually sit down with us. And I have to say it was a really hard one for me, particularly to, to film, because it's this idea that I approach all my subjects with an enormous amount of, of empathy and judgment always last. I am there to really try to place myself in their shoes. And with them, it was really hard. I remember interviewing one guy, uh, a pimp who went by the name of Jack Knife, and you know, him telling us a story about once a woman fled that works for him and he cut her, sold the sole of her feet with a razor blade. I cut the bottom of her foot with a razor. With a razor? So, so you hold were- on, Hold on, it's pimps out here doing way worse Man. That was really hard for me to just not leave the room immediately and to keep wanting to listen to his story. But then sort of hearing the rest of the story and where he grew up and who are the heroes in his neighborhood and why he does what he does and all what led to this life essentially was really fascinating. Our home is the training ground for her dreams policy. Ensure carefully. Dream fearlessly. Talk a little bit about policy changes that you would make, you know, having had the advantage of, of going deep across multiple different sectors and not only here, uh, but outside of the U.S. If you were able to whisper in the president's ear, what would be one of the top two or three things that you'd, you'd want that person to consider given all that you've seen? I would say at the end of the day, black markets exist because of poverty and inequality. And so if we sort of look at drugs, for example, we have to realize that the war on drugs is not working. Nothing has changed. The overdose rates keep on going up, especially in 2020 with COVID. Violence in Mexico, our neighbor, is more deaths than ever before this past year. So we have to do something about it. And so I look at examples like my country, where I grew up in 
Portugal, where several years ago they decided to decriminalize drugs. And it's been an enormous success. Um, the rates of incarceration have gone down dramatically, drug overdoses have gone down. And so it's about looking at examples around the world where it's worked and realizing and admitting once and for all that what we're doing currently and the billions we're spending are just not working. Talk to me about race. What have you learned? I realize that's a big, broad question, but I also realize that you bring so many interesting vantage points and experiences What are a couple of the things that are on the top of your mind when you think about questions of race? I think that unfortunately, traveling around the world, you see that poverty and inequality sort of falls much heavier. It's a much bigger burden on the shoulders of minorities. And there is such quick judgment and no real willingness to try to understand why a person becomes a criminal. You know, I, I really truly don't think anyone is born one day and decides oh, I'm going to become a criminal and I want to be a drug trafficker. And so I, again, I think if you do not address the root problem, and again, it's inequality and poverty, you will never be able to combat black markets. How much when you're looking at the black markets, do you bump into white collar and uh, the uptown lawyer or the uptown banker or others who are participating in this? A lot. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons why people agree to talk to us is because we protect their identities, right? And we take that very seriously. And so we distort voices, we use masks, we do a lot of things to change and make sure that they are not identified. But I would say that behind those masks are a lot of times people that you wouldn't expect, especially when talking about users when it comes to opiates, users when it comes to meth, and the majority of the users that we filmed with were actually, you know, a lawyer, a suburban mom, I mean, not the people at all that you'd expect. I'm always asking people on the show about dreaming fearlessly because I feel like we are in such a fluid, interesting, sometimes challenging moment. Uh, What have you learned about dreaming fearlessly that you would share with a younger version of yourself? Dreaming fearlessly. um, I think that just no no dream is unobtainable. Um, You know, when I was 12 years old, you know, and decided I wanted to be a journalist, uh, I knew I would be a journalist one day. I knew I could get there. I just never in my wildest dreams would I think that I would have the job that I have now. I feel so incredibly privileged to be able to have this opportunity to explore these sort of dark and secretive worlds and to meet the people that I meet. Again, the most, you know, ostracized and stereotyped people in our society and how incredibly privileged am I to be able to not only be there in person, but then be able to share it with our our viewers. So no dream is too crazy, I would say. Most beautiful place you've ever been, or at least one of the most beautiful places you've ever been. My hometown, Lisbon. Uh, What's your favorite movie? Favorite movie is a documentary called Science Fair, uh, which was actually directed by my husband. <laughs> I, you know, I love that you're biased. That's really good. Uh, if you could have dinner um, with any person, uh, alive or dead, who would excite you to actually meet? I, I would love to have dinner with El Chapo. And the reason why is, you know, I've been scooped once by Sean Penn when I went looking for El Chapo. And then a month later, actually, Sean Penn had the opportunity to sit down and talk to El Chapo. And that really pissed me off. (laughs) And what's your karaoke song? Oh, Madonna. Holiday. (laughs) My husband is probably thinking over there. He always begs me to not dance or sing. (laughs) Even though I think I'm a fantastic dancer and singer. (laughs) You you know what? Tell him I'm voting with you. I don't know a lot, but tell him that that I'm voting with you. Um, Mario, I so enjoy this. And I really do hope that we get a chance to meet in person. It would... uh, It'd be a treat. I'd love to get to meet you properly. Um, yeah, we should definitely meet. And if you do go to Lisbon, you cannot go without letting me know because I have a lot of places for you to go. Well, you know, I like you. You're my kind of person. I'm the same kind of person. So when you come up to the Bay Area, you and I will do it. And when I come to LA, you and I will have Brazilian food together because I like the Brazilian food that you have down there. I look forward to it. I love it. Thank you, Carlos. I love that. 
Hey, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Mariana. What a fascinating person. What an interesting person. I love her toughness. I love her thoughtfulness. Uh, I can imagine how difficult that is for her to be empathetic in a lot of those situations. I was taken by what she talked about in terms of that one particular pimp. Probably not uh, easy at all. But you know what I especially love? I especially love someone like this, the idea of them being at a policy table. So not only telling us these stories, but helping us think about how the world could be better and different. I would love it if she were one of the people who the president-elect and others were turning to. Who knows? Maybe we'll see. I um, hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you'll try more of us. Don't forget to subscribe and, and tell people about the show. If you think it's something special, tell folks about it and come on back and try our podcast. I'll see you soon.